So we will start with a very special uh, speaker and, and the session that I'm personally waiting the most. So she is our speaker. She is told to be the most influential individual uh, in the artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in the world. So in her uh, everyday work at Microsoft, she is trying to use computers uh, to fight the climate change and help environment. She is using for it uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it's, it seems like a good move. So because human intelligence is not always doing our planet very well. Please welcome on stage Mrs. Jennifer Marsman. Hello, my name is Jennifer Marsman and I am a machine learning engineer and data scientist for Microsoft on the AI for Earth team. And today, I wanna to cover two things with you. First, I wanna spend maybe two slides and very briefly talk to you about the AI for Earth grant program because there's a lot of resources that hopefully some of you can leverage. And then secondly, I'm gonna spend the majority of the talk uh, talking about five different cases of how people are using machine learning to monitor, model, and manage Earth's natural resources. Oh, and they do have a blog, and I am on Twitter, so if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to me on social media, however you're most comfortable. All right, so back in December 2017, uh, Brad Smith, who is the president of Microsoft, made an announcement at a conference in Paris that Microsoft was publicly committing 50 million US dollars over a five-year time frame to anyone doing machine learning or data science work in the areas of agriculture, water, climate change, or biodiversity. And there are a lot of big problems in this space. And when I think about things like climate change and all of the increase in natural disasters we're having, um, wildfires, um, tsunamis, all sorts of things that we've been seeing in recent years, the only thing that's kept up with the rising rate of climate change and the exponential effect is the exponential impact machine learning has been able to have. So I got my graduate degree in AI 15 years ago, so gives away my age a little. But at that time, there was just so much that we didn't have that we do have today. So since that time, we've figured out automatic machine translation, facial recognition, like all of these other things, speech to text, text to speech, all of those are essentially solved problems at this point. So thinking about how we could apply machine learning with that exponential growth pattern to some of these really hard problems is where my team is really trying to, to make a difference. And so the main thing, uh, when I came and I was talking about coming to this uh, conference, the main thing I was looking at was, okay, um, let me take a look and see if there's any grant applications. And at the time, um, this was back when I agreed to do this, which was several months ago, a long time ago, maybe at least six months ago. But at that time, there was no grant applications from Poland or any of the surrounding countries. So I wanted to take a quick opportunity and let you know that there is a big pot of free money available, so if anyone knows or knows of, uh, you have academic colleagues or startups or nonprofits, anyone who is doing work in this space, tell them, let them know that this is out there, because I do want you guys to take advantage of it so we can all kind of make a difference together. Okay, that was the quick pitch, done with that. Now, what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about today is five different stories. So I want to go through five examples of people, including my own team, who are using and leveraging the AI for Earth grant money to be able to build really cool things. So we have a couple stories. And I'm gonna start with Project Premonition. So this is some project that's being done by Microsoft Research, so it's, it's funding work inside of Microsoft. But um, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. So the idea behind Project Premonition is, can we predict outbreaks of disease before they happen, all right? And when you think about things like um, the Zika virus and West Nile and back several long years ago, there was mad cow disease and some of these other things. Um, these, these infectious diseases, 75% um, of them actually originate with animals and then spread to humans. And you can see some of them do have cutesy names like avian flu or uh, mad cow disease that tells you where they came from. But a lot of them don't have the names but still start with animals. 
And so the idea behind Project Premonition is, can we take some of these, um, can we leverage um, data like if we had random blood samples from people in an environment, in animals in an environment, we could potentially predict these outbreaks of disease before they become an outbreak. And so, someone had the brilliant idea, it wasn't me, but someone had the brilliant idea of what if we leverage little data collectors who are out in the environment already collecting random blood samples. And those are, of course, mosquitoes. So mosquitoes fly around, they bite uh, animals, they bite people, and then what we can do then is we, we actually contributed kind of two main parts of research here. Number one is a smart trap. I, there's an intelligent trap that can selectively catch mosquitoes and only mosquitoes um, of other, and actually down to the species level of mosquito, it can only trap certain kinds of mosquitoes as well. And then secondly, um, a metagenomics pipeline where once we catch mosquitoes that have consumed a blood meal, we can actually reverse engineer that blood and tell what animal it bit and what diseases they carry. So that's what we're going to talk about first. Um, okay. So, um, the, what, the, what the actual trap looks like, I'll show you a picture in just a second, but what the actual trip, trip, uh, intelligent trap looks like is a little cylinder, it's about this big, it's very small, and then there's 64 individual little doors on it that open and close independently. And um, in the middle is a, is a cylinder, uh, and you can put a lure down the center. So we've experimented with a variety of lures. We've used um, light, various lights, which uh, insects are attracted to. We've used scents. Um, and then we've used uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, which uh, we, as humans, exhale and uh, insects are attracted to. And so we've been able to, you know, depending on the type of insect, but around 90% accuracy for uh, trapping various types of, of insects. And then there's been a number of experiments. Those numbers are actually out of date. It's been even more than that in terms of experiments and mosquito landings and such. So let me kind of jump into the two things that we contributed. So the first is this robotic field biologist, or the smart trap is the first major contribution of this research. And so the idea behind that is, can we selectively capture these uh, species of insects? And uh, by terrestrial arthropods, that just means insects or bugs. Um, so insects are a lot of things. They're disease vectors, they're pollinators, they're bioindicators and pests and a lot of other things. But the blood-feeding insects are specifically the ones that we are interested in for this purpose of uh, predicting disease. And you can get a sense for the, the scope of how many of these uh, there are in the world. When you look at all terrestrial uh, vertebrates, that's about 10 to the fourth. So that is all of um, any land-dwelling animal with a backbone. And then terrestrial arthropods is essentially bugs, all insects. And there's uh, um, approximately 10 to the six different species of those. And then, the next part of that, once we've captured those um, mosquitoes with blood, we need the metagenomics pipeline to be able to go to the next step and actually get down to the disease level. And with that, with that, once we have that blood and that data, there's all the bullets you see listed there are the things that we can do with it, be able to find known and novel viruses and uh, disease vectors and such. And this is a really fun fact. So, the estimated bacteria and viruses you see right there, it's estimated that there are 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 9th different species of bacteria and viruses. Do you know how many viruses we actually have names for right now? Anyone know? It's 4,500. Not 45,000, 4,500 different viruses actually have names right now. So I'm going to mention novel viruses a couple times. I know that sounds like really scary, we found a novel virus, but it actually happens all the time because not that many of them actually have names. So you can get a sense for how much we don't know um, in this world and, and what we could do with um, machine learning to use this metagenomics. And there's actually machine learning in both parts of this, in the robotic trap as well as the metagenomics analysis, and we'll talk about that now. All right, so let's start with the trap. You guys should be able to see the little video on the right. If you watch that center cell, the very middle row and middle column, um, there we go, this little bug, and boom, did you guys see it? It's on repeat, so keep watching that middle cell if you missed it. Um, but essentially, that is what the trap looks like. This is with an infrared lighting, so you're only getting kind of uh, black and white type imagery. But there's the mosquito, and boom, the little uh, trap door just went down. It recognized that it was a mosquito, and closed and captured the mosquito in there. And it's important to note that it doesn't use any kind of fan or suction like traditional insect traps do. And so if you look at the, um, the image on the left, 
Like that is an example of a mosquito that we captured here. And that's not really that exciting for you or me, but entomologists, people who study bugs, if they see a specimen like that, they get really excited because it's not squished or messed up at all like you get with suction and with fans. It's in pristine condition. Um, and that's an example of an Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito, which is the species that carries the Zika virus. Different species of mosquitoes actually carry different viruses. It's very interesting. I learned so much about, uh, <laughs> about bugs um, based on this research. Okay, the main points I wanna make on this slide, um, Two things, really. Number one, I wanted to show you the size, just for comparison. You can see the size of that robotic trap um, relative to a human being. So you can see it's actually a very, you know, it's like about this tall, this one, right around, so not very big. It's uh, mounted on a tripod right there, so you can see it in a village in um, Tanzania. And then the other point I want to make is that this is leveraging AI on the edge, so edge computing. We need to have that machine learning model actually baked into the trap. Um, because, you know, a couple of reasons. Number one, you have to be fast, right? And network traffic takes time uh, to go up to the cloud and, and back down. Um, and the mosquito or the bug is not going to hang around that long necessarily. Uh, so you have to make a decision very quickly. And our system actually makes a decision within seven milliseconds of whether to close the door or not. And then the second thing is that you don't, uh, there, this enables it to work in areas where uh, Wi-Fi may not be available or the internet connectivity may be spotty. So very rural areas, um, that sort of thing you can still make, uh, make do. And you can see there's one woman on a cell phone there, so they, they obviously have uh, cell phone coverage in that area, but the Wi-Fi can be pretty spotty in that area. It's fairly remote, you can only access it uh, via a, um, a river as well. And it is a village that's very heavily affected by things like dengue and Zika and such. So it's really good to have kind of th that kind of monitoring there available for people. All right. And then the other thing that's exciting to all of us who love machine learning is the more we deploy it, the smarter it gets, the more it learns. So uh, one of the things that's really, truly exciting is that uh, we can, with about 90% accuracy, be able to sell, um, separate the West Nile uh, mosquitoes, which are the, um, the Culix genus mosquitoes, from the Aedes aegypti, which are the ones that carry Zika. So two different species of mosquitoes actually carry those, those two different diseases, which is pretty interesting. And then here's some examples of, um, these are all from uh, some data collection that we did in Houston, Texas, around the time of the Zika outbreak, which was maybe two years ago now, two, three years ago now. And uh, we set up traps right in Houston where there were some instances of, of Zika. And uh, we, these are a couple of the examples of things that we ha we've caught. Um, the first image that you see there is a tsetse fly. And tsetse flies are one of the main disease factors for um, African sleeping sickness they carry. The second one is a scarab beetle. Uh, the scarab beetle is a bioindicator as well as an agricultural pest. And then the last one is a very rare form of mosquito that we actually found um, in Gombe, in the area where Jane Goodall did the work with the chimpanzees. So that was a mosquito that was feeding on chimpanzee blood, which was kind of interesting as well. And then let me break down all the little charts below each image. So the first thing that you'll see in the upper left for you is um, basically each little uh, door, so each of those 64 cells has a little infrared light sensor, essentially. So as the bug flies through, it essentially captures the, the pattern of light that, that flies by. So one of the primary indicators is actually the, the wing beat speed. So that's something that we can use as a feature in our machine learning algorithm, because as the bugs go in and out, basically the wing beat frequency is captured um, from that light LED, um, the patterns of light that are falling. And that's what you can see in that first image, is just the data that we're getting from that sensor, that single sensor. And so that's in the time domain. The second image underneath it is just an FFT of that, uh, of that thing, so a Fourier transform. And it's, um, so that's just frequency domain of the same time domain signal. And then finally, up in the upper right-hand corner, uh, that shows which of the 64 cells was activated. So it doesn't really matter for you and I, but that's the one that they happen to be in. And then the final thing that you see in the bottom right-hand corner is all of the different um, data points that we capture. So every time an insect probes, we actually capture a bunch of data, even if we don't decide to trap the insect. So we can actually capture things like barometric pressure, latitude, longitude, um, ambient light. Um, so all kinds of conditions about the weather and um, atmosphere to kind of tell what attracts certain bugs and, and be able to use that data as well. All right, so here's some of the complex behaviors that we were able to learn. And essentially what these, 
What these actually kind of uh, represent are basically the weights that are used on the machine learning algorithm. So you can kind of see things like in the, um, in, let's see if I can get my cursor over there. Actually, I can't see it from there, so it's not gonna work. But you can see the second uh, row, third column, that uh, there's a, a turquoise and an orange line. So the turquoise actually represents the Aedes aegypti mosquito, and then the orange one represents the Culex one, which is the um, West Nile uh, mosquito. And so you can see there that there's a very distinctive dip around the, uh, the, the turquoise uh, one, and that's because it's a little bit more sensitive to things like barometric pressure. That's actually the reading for barometric pressure. And you can see a lot of um, variety there, whereas it doesn't really affect the Culex uh, mosquito at all. That one holds steady. So really, really interesting things that we can learn. So this, is, this data is based on uh, about 20 gigabytes of data that was collected from the Houston study. And um, it, that's really interesting for, I mean, for us, you can actually see that one of them is more active during the day and one of them is more active in the evening. So you can apply bug spray accordingly or that sort of thing. But this is also really interesting information for say, the Department of Public Health, because they can then optimize and, and spray pesticides at the optimal time when the most mosquitoes are out and active and hopefully take out the most of them um, if there are danger of um, spreading uh, um, infectious diseases like this. All right, so then the next part of this. So we have this mosquito captured, but we wanna go beyond just these physical characteristics. We need to get down to the genomic level if we're really gonna understand what viruses they're carrying as well as what animals you know, did they feed on. Once we have that blood, what do we do? And so you can see right there, we have an example. Um, on the left, again, we see some blooded mosquitoes who have consumed a blood meal. And then on the right, we actually transform them into highly concentrated DNA. And so that is then used and fed into um, a genomic analyzer. And then what we're trying to do with the output of that is um, use uh, metagenomics to figure out the composition. So we have that DNA sample, and then basically we need to test it against the whole database of partially sequenced life forms, which is at least, it's a ton of data. And so we need to be able to do that as fast as possible. And the output that we want to produce is basically a computed recipe of what exactly constitutes um, that DNA sample. So you can think of things like um, if you ever um, are, are, you know, you're going out for a drink um, at a bar and you don't really know what to order, so you just get whatever your friend got. And you don't know really what is in it and you kind of taste maybe some orange juice and maybe vodka or rum, definitely not tequila, because tequila does not go well with you. And um, you taste it and you're like, oh, that seems pretty good, but you have no idea what's actually in it because you were a good girl and you were at the library studying probably instead of going to the bar. So you're tasting this drink and you're trying to figure out what exactly composes that drink. So that's exactly what we're doing here. And you can see, here's one possible combination of things that we might see. One, um, in this particular thing, it's roughly 90% mosquito, which is that Aedes aegypti species that we, uh, is responsible for Zika. Um, about 5% of it is Homo sapiens, which means that that mosquito bit a human, and we're uh, detecting some of the, the human DNA in there. And then you can see a very, very, very small percentage of that sample is actually a novel um, rhabdovirus, so the human may have been carrying that. And that is a, um, I, I know again, novel viruses, it sounds scary, but remember how many viruses are out there and how many we actually have names for. And that's actually just a virus that's in the rabies family. So very similar to that. And so we, we are able to compute that recipe. Now, how do we do that? Um, a couple of features of this approach. Um, so first of all, we're using an algorithm called SNAP, and I must say this was developed um, a joint work between Microsoft Research and uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, so UC Berkeley did a, did a ton of work here. And so what they do is they actually are using, um, uh, they're comparing, so first of all, the cloud is absolutely necessary for this because we're trying to scale out a whole lot of computes when you consider the size of all of the data you need to compare. And so um, in this particular case, it was about three hours running on 200 Azure Compute nodes. It's actually gotten better since then, so it runs a little bit more efficiently. And then of course, the more nodes you scale it out between, the faster it'll run as well. So you can scale out even further and, and run it faster too. Um, but what it's doing is actually applying a Bayesian mixture model. And so what that allows us to do is essentially um, figure out the, the commonalities um, and what's most probabilistically likely um, and being able to do kind of 
short, shorter edit distances uh, between strings. And then what we're able to do is make, um, basically boost certain signals. Like in this case, you can see maybe um, when there's a lot of, an animal that shares a lot of common DNA in the tree of life. So think about like a rat and a mouse, for example. In this case, it could boost the signal of the rat and, and dampen the signal of the mouse if in fact it was um, a, a rat. So that's, the, um, that's essentially kind of what it's doing. And then um, we actually have some tools to visualize all this data as well, because it's um, a lot. So you can actually, uh, it gives you a little pie shape, and then you can drill into different sections to get more information about those various subsections. And it does integrate with the Krona visualizer, which is a very common visualization tool that's used um, for genomics. And so to get a sense of our accuracy, um, to recover synthetic metagenomics, it's 99.99% accurate. So what I mean by that is if we randomly sample some mosquito uh, DNA, we randomly sample, say, a human or some other animal that we know, and then we randomly sample for some viruses, and then we put that into the model and get the results back, we're 99.99% accurate at that. Um, if we do regular sampling from human and animal, I'm sorry, from mosquito and animal, and then we go into the novel virus space, so we start you know, putting together viruses that we haven't really seen before, um, but we want to be able to see if it can place them in the, roughly the right family. Um, we're 97% accurate at that. And then, of course, the next step after that is doing actual lab testing where we give mosquitoes um, blood and then knowing what's in that blood and then reverse engineer to see if uh, we can, in fact, figure it out. And you can see the accuracy there is very good as well. All right, so there's kind of another thing that we can do with that as well. So up to now, I've been focused on disease um, monitoring, but you can also use this to judge the health and the makeup of an ecosystem, and that's one of the other things that AI for Earth cares about. So what we're doing is kind of using an internet of, of insects to be able to get information. And there's two primary different things that we can get. So one is insect composition by telling, okay, what are the different insects that make up um, again, you don't have to capture them, but if they just fly in and fly out, and if we have various classifiers to say, okay, this one is a tetsy fly, this one is a scarab beetle, this is this type of mosquito, we can take that information and then be able to say, okay, here's you know, the, the things that flew into our trap, we can get a sense of what the insect composition may be in a certain area. And then secondly, if we do take, um, capture the blooded insects, what we can do then is take the reverse engineer that, that blood and then be able to tell the various host animals uh, that are in an area. So if you want to get a sense for what animals live here, you can you know, set out a trap and, and wait and collect blood and see what different animals um, you pick up. And of course, there is bias in that data, bias towards which um, animals mosquitoes are most likely to bite, but always, always consider your bias when you're doing working with data. All right, and so there was actually kind of a cool um, Florida Keys uh, experiment we did. And the Florida Keys are actually a series of islands off of uh, Florida, but they're very interesting because they each have their own little um, distinct makeup because they've been separated by water, so things have evolved slightly differently between the islands. So we did um, some work there, and it was very interesting, uh, the things that, that we learned there, to range uh, um, 19 different families of, of insects. Okay, so if you want more information, this is called Project Premonition, and there's more information on it in the Microsoft Research page online, so feel free to check it out. And that uh, guy in the picture is uh, Ethan Jackson, who is uh, one of Microsoft's uh, principal researchers on this work. All right, the next one is Farm Beats. So Farm Beats is around data-driven farming. How can we use machine learning um, to make farming more efficient? And where this got started is um, in a meeting of the United Nations in 2009, it was announced that we actually need to double our current rate of food production by the year 2050, or we are just not going to have enough food to feed everyone just because of the rising rate of the, the world's growing population. And so we started to look at, you know, what are some ways that we could be smarter about growing food? How do you do that? And so we hit upon, we started with the idea of precision agriculture. So I was not familiar with precision agriculture uh, prior to this, some of you guys may be. But the idea behind precision agriculture is, let's, let's take irrigation as an example. Instead of homogeneously watering a field so that every part of the field gets the exact same amount of water, you can actually measure how much water does each part of the field need and only water the parts that actually need it, right? Because if there's a little dip in the hill, water will run down, there's more water here than there will be on the slope. Those kind of little things. Um, and so we can do uh, those kind of things um, fairly easily, right? So that seems like it would be an easy problem to solve, right? Anyone do IoT work? 
I have, nice, those sensors, you can measure water levels, that seems like it'd be fairly easy to do. Now, um, when I was first meeting with the principal researcher on this one, Ranveer Chandra, he told me, no, it's actually about $1,000 a sensor to do this. And I was like, are you crazy? Um, hold on, look at this website. You can get sensors for much cheaper than this. And he's like, no, 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 of course, of course. He, he, he knew what he was talking about. And it's about tens of dollars to uh, get a sensor. So I, my next thought was, okay, maybe it's power, right? Um, you don't have electrical outlets in the middle of a field. So maybe we need, uh, there's a different way to bring in power or something. But it turns out we actually use solar panels to do this. So the solar panels, um, uh, you know, can collect light, and then that is more than sufficient, even in dark and dreary Seattle, where uh, Microsoft's main campus is, that the light that was given there was uh, sufficient to power it for, for some time. Um, and so, and then while I'm at it, let me just show you real quickly, uh, that's kind of the, the sensors that we have. You can see the, in the upper uh, left, kind of our sensor board, which is embedded in this, this uh, waterproof casing, and there's a couple of leads that trail out, and so you can take those leads and bury them in the soil to get like moisture levels at, you know, four inches and 12 inches underground, that sort of thing, to measure all of that data. So that's, that's actually how we do it. It's this mounted um, waterproof casing right there. And then there's a camera that's also mounted on that solar panel, and it's actually taking imagery in both RGB, natural color, um, as well as infrared, so you can get kind of a sense of things at night as well. Okay, so how, where is this $1,000 to sensor coming from? We have tens of dollars for the, um, the actual sensor. We have maybe a hundred tops for the, um, the solar panel, so where is the extra you know, $900 coming from? Turns out the answer there is connectivity. It's getting the data out of the farm or off of the kind of the ground in those sensors and, and uh, hubs and into the cloud where we can aggregate it and actually do something useful with it. And so what we decided to do, there's actually kind of a twofold solution to this. One of them is to use, um, use fewer sensors. So okay, we can do that. And so the way we were able to get away with using fewer sensors is, um, you know, we put some sensors strategically in the ground and then you couple that with aerial imagery. So we actually started with drones flying overhead um, that will fly over the farmland and take images. And then for the, we, can, we built a machine learning algorithm that actually inputs both the data from the sensors that we do have together with that aerial imagery. And then we can use those together to extrapolate the data for the whole field and then be able to figure out everything together. And then you also see a big, that's, uh, that's Ranveer Chandra, who is uh, the principal in, uh, uh, researcher on this one. And he's actually using a helium balloon as well. So uh, we started, we still use drones primarily, but when, when there's um, either a cost issue on a drone or a battery life issue, which is a big one, because even the best drones only fly for like probably an hour tops. And then um, uh, regulations is also a big one. There's a lot of countries where it's just very, very hard to fly a drone um, legally. Um, and so for those cases, we actually use um, a low-tech solution, which is just a very large, um, very strong helium balloon. And you can put that up and still get um, a cone of, of aerial imagery as well over some farmland. All right, so then putting that together, that aerial imagery, whether it's from a drone or from a, um, um, a, a balloon, you can take that aerial imagery and couple it with the data that you have from the sensors and then build these machine learning maps. So these are using a Gaussian process under the covers to be able to, to work this together. But conceptually, you can really think about two different things that it's doing. So number one, it's using spatial uh, similarity. So meaning if, um, if I have a patch of land right here and a patch of land right next to it, things that are close together in space are probably going to have roughly similar values. So you can utilize that. And then the second part of it is visual similarity. So if I have a patch of land over here that's kind of darker because it's been freshly watered, for example, and another patch of land that's the same darker shade over here, then those may have both been freshly irrigated and so they're both, um, they both have similar water levels, for example. So we can do all kinds of things like that. So that's essentially um, how, the, how the ML works there. So then we can put that all together and be able to provide um, a whole spatial temporal view of the farm. And that's only touching on um, a tiny part of it, which is the precision agriculture. Um, and I kind of only talked about precision irrigation. There's a whole lot of other um, precision um, 
fertilization, precision pesticides is one of my favorites, right? Because nobody wants people spraying pesticides everywhere. It's, you know, it's bad for the environment. It's bad for us who are eating the food. And it's actually really bad for the farmer because pesticides are very expensive. So if we can you know, reduce that using machine learning, so either number one, you can predict where the pests are gonna be and only spray there. Or number two, you can actually use computer vision and in real time when you see pests moving in, spray them. Like th there's all kinds of different solutions you could potentially use. So lots of great stuff there. Oh, and there's also been a lot of interesting work on um, yield estimation. So predicting the best times to plant, for example, to maximize the yield um, in a still a sustainable way. And the folks in Microsoft Research in India have actually done some amazing work on that. All right, and then one last thing. So coming back to the connectivity thing. So one of the things I mentioned to solve the connectivity problem was to just use less sensors, right? We had fewer sensors that we actually planted. But the second thing is a better optimized way of getting the data into the cloud. So traditionally, you would use either cell phone coverage, right? You have uh, um, uh, your cell phone, but if any of you have ever driven or taken the train through the countryside, you know that cell phone coverage can be very spotty in very rural areas, right? Um, and then Wi-Fi is also great technology, but the problem with Wi-Fi is, I know at my house, my Wi-Fi stretches probably the, the length of my house and that's it. Like even if I go across the street to pick up my kid from the bus stop, like there's, uh, I'm out of range, like Wi-Fi's gone. So it, it's just very, very small. So the idea is, um, and, and Ranveer did this work, his, his PhD work was in, in networking, and so the idea was, what if we used sent, let's, let's say that we sent um, data packets over unused television channels, okay? So think about this. Television channels actually operate at a much lower frequency. So typical Wi-Fi is in about the five gigahertz range, and TV is much, much, much lower. So remember, lower frequency waves like stretch much further, right? So if you have one of these television white space routers, you can actually connect to it from 10 miles away, no problem. So really, really cool work. So sorry, this has nothing to do with machine learning. I just think it's awesome, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, so really, really cool stuff that you can use to be able to, um, to connect with this. And so you do have to work with the local government. Um, you can't just start sending data packets over unused television channels because the government does own those. Um, but you, you kind of have to work with them. But uh, we've been able to stand it up successfully um, in Kenya. We have a, um, a, a stand up in, in Seattle, outside the Seattle, Washington area in the US, and a number of other spaces. But um, in, in rural areas, there tend to be a lot of unoccupied television channels. So it's really cool. So that's been um, a lot of great work. And so there's actually a Microsoft effort called Airband which is leveraging this technology to try to stand up internet in more places. Okay, and then we have pilots going all over the world, really, really great stuff. Okay, so, and that's the, if you wanna see the overall thing, there it is, there's a thing online, you can get that from our website. Okay, next one. This is work that's being done. So the two things that I've talked about before were primarily done through Microsoft Research. Um, there was a collaboration with some universities and such, but a lot of it's Microsoft Research. These, these next three are not Microsoft, so I wanna give credit to the proper person. Um, so this, the spot work here, systematic poacher detector, this was work that's done by USC, um, the University of Southern California. And so the problem they were trying to solve is the poaching, right? Poaching is a very, very real problem. So you can see this uh, news article from NPR where nearly 90 elephants were killed um, in a sanctuary by poachers. And if you take a look at the date, zoom in on the date there, you can see that that was about six months ago. So this is not like a problem that's, oh, a long time ago or something like that. Like this is a very real problem that is happening right now. So, um, and it's a hard, hard problem. Like there are limited resources in one of these large things. These are very large animals. When you talk about elephants and rhinos, these animals take up a lot of space and travel a lot of um, area. And so just taking a quick um, <laughs> Google Maps drawing of that thing, you can see, um, since you guys think in kilometers, um, over uh, 560 kilometers um, of space that, that these animals could roam. And we need to have, uh, um, things that, or park rangers covering all of that space and figuring out the best places to go. So they're doing a lot of, uh, USC is doing a lot of machine learning work, both to predict where the poachers will be, um, as well as other things. So 
Let's, again, here's a little bit more on the economics of poaching. Um, you can see that ivory is actually worth um, $1,000 a pound. And when you compare that to the average per capita income across um, Africa in that area, it's about $762. Um, and so uh, with ivory and then gold and then rhino horns, example, uh, rhino horns are literally worth more than gold. Um, if you take down one elephant, that's 52 to 104 years of income. So it's, it's, there's huge financial incentives to, to do this. Um, so like, how do we, you know, how do we stop it? Um, in this case, there's, uh, here's how the state of the art works right now. In these or, um, sanctuaries, they have drones flying overhead. So again, we're utilizing drones. And the drones have infrared cameras on them. So it's using um, infrared, because primarily poaching happens at night, so it's dark. So infrared works better there. And then there are human beings that actually sit there and monitor the video stream that's coming back from the drones. But it's a UV, um, it's, I'll show you a picture of it in a second, but it's very, very hard to see. And then remember, this is happening overnight, so the humans tend to get tired and, you know, your natural fatigue, you want to go to sleep at night. So the human detection often degrades with the fatigue. And as well as there's a scale problem, right? Because the more drones you put in the air, the more humans you need to monitor the feed coming back from the drone. Because remember, this has to happen in real time, right? Once somebody hits the you know, gun and boom, the animal's gone, like there's no rewind button. So in real time, you need to figure out, okay, there's a poacher here and like sends, um, send a ranger after them um, before, it's, before it's too late. And so the spot work is an application that allows it, um, instead of having humans have to monitor everything, it's using computer vision to automatically detect both poachers as well as elephants' locations, and then um, in near real time as needed, and this is building on um, faster RCNN. All right, and here's a look at these pictures so you guys can see like, exactly how hard of a, a computer vision problem this is. So that first, um, that first quadrant that you see, the first one in the A um, row, is an example of what the, the human being would actually see. All right, and then um, on the right-hand column, we've actually labeled where the real poacher is. There is a poacher in there. And then the B column is um, thresholded, where we actually took things that were above a certain level and then made them pop a little more with the white. But you can see a lot of things actually pop, so there's a lot of kind of false positives there. And then finally, um, we have, there's a real issue with stabilization as well, because one of the things that makes it most easy to detect elephants and humans is motion, right? But you have a problem when the drones are actually moving overhead and the people are moving below, you have to do stabilization to be able to, um, you have to do some fun math to basically be able to make that all work out okay, since it's something with motion against something else that's moving as well. Um, so hard, very hard problem for a number of reasons. Number one, um, the, the varying altitude of this makes it very tricky, right? Because the, if the drones are flying harder, the, it could be like 20 pixels is, is the human. Very hard there. The stabilization problem that I already mentioned. And then finally, the fact that this is, you know, uh, infrared images, like these black and white blurry things are very, very hard to, to make sense of. So it's single band, it's low resolution, it's not, it's not great. And then we have to get results in real time so that someone can go after the poacher. Um, and there's limited computing power and limited um, internet, typically, in these large sanctuaries. So a whole lot of problems that make this really, really hard. And so here's the solution that they came up with. Um, this is the spot architecture. So all of the training of the model is done offline, um, where they, they train and create the model. And then while the drone is flying, they actually capture that live video stream. It gets sent back to a central uh, laptop. They have usually one big laptop on site that has GPU running on it. And so if the internet connection is bad, they'll do everything from that local laptop. And then if the internet connection is doing okay, they'll send it to Azure. And there's actually two different Azure configurations they have set up. Um, Azure Basic and Azure Advanced, they call them. The main difference between them is Azure Basic um, is backed by a single um, uh, virtual machine running GPU. And then the advanced uh, setup is backed by a whole um, Kubernetes cluster of GPU machines. All right, and here's a video that kind of shows their success. This was a, a test, a pilot they did, so these are not actually real poachers. This was a test that they ran to see how it would do. So you can see the drone is flying overhead, and um, when it has the little purple squares around it, it's, it's recognizing that there are people there. So you can see they, they do flick in and out a little bit, but neat things that can see, show them running, and you can kind of see the, the white popping out right there, and that there are actually people there. And um, the drone is set to actually fly after them, too, when people try to run. So um, great work from USC and the stuff that they're doing. 
All right, the next one is something called iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a really neat application where they are able to take, um, take uh, data from a variety of people. So everyone, uh, they have a crowdsourced implementation of data of animals, plants, and fungi that are uh, present in nature. And then they compile that all and make it available to researchers and academics and conservational biologists to understand kind of the, the makeup of the biodiversity of the world. And so the way they do that is they actually have an app. So you can actually go download it yourself. It's fabulous. I use it all the time on just on nature walks. It's really fun if I, you know, my kid asks me, hey mom, what's that plant? And I have no idea what that plant is, you guys. I, no idea. But what I can do is I can take my phone and then I can point, you can point at that using the iNaturalist app and take a picture. And then what we're doing is the data that they want um, to make available to people, they want to be labeled data. So they want basically, here's an animal or a plant that was spotted at this location at this time, but they want you to identify what animal or what plant it was. And that's hard for regular people like me. And so what they were doing, um, you can see a lot of online, it's a very vibrant community with lots of observations and stuff, but the problem they were having is that they had to, there was a huge bottleneck in the system where these expert users had to like verify, okay, this person was right about what they thought, that is actually that species of plant, et cetera, et cetera. And so huge bottleneck to have human verification for everything. So what they do instead now is um, we worked with them and created a machine learning model um, built on the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit or the CNTK and um, built a model based on all of the data they had already collected that was labeled and built a species uh, recognition um, algorithm. And so that then can be used to make this a little easier. So um, here's an example now, instead of having to have everything go through the expert users, the computer vision can augment that a little bit. So let me just make this real by giving you a real example. So this is a picture that I took um, with my camera when I was in Stockholm for ICML um, last year, I think. And I zoomed in all the way, that's why it's a little bit grainy around the edges. But I saw this random bird. And I figured it was probably a heron, or a stork, or a crane, but I had no idea which of those. And so what I did was I opened up iNaturalist, I imported that, that picture, and you can see um, it can automatically grab the metadata from there, so it, it knows the date. And then location, um, if you take the picture right inside the app, it will actually grab location for you as well, but I had imported it as a file. So I just did uh, get current location, and then I was able to fill in the, the location as well. And so now, um, this is where the fun machine learning part comes in. The what did you see, view suggestions. If you tap on that, that invokes the machine learning classifier, and so it takes that data, so that particular image, as well as um, location information if you choose to provide it, and then it can um, provide a, you know, what it thinks it is. And so in this case, you can say that it's very confident that it's a heron. They're very confident it's in the great herons genus. Um, and then they give you the top five um, things that they think it is. And so just looking at those visually, I was able to tell it definitely wasn't the uh, Kokoi heron or the great egret because the, the image looked completely different, but it actually looked pretty similar to both the gray heron and the great blue heron, the top two choices there. Um, and you can actually click into each of these for more details. And what I actually found was that the great heron is primarily found in Africa and Europe, and the great blue heron is primarily North America. And so you can actually see that visually similar uh, slash seen nearby. So that, that actually helped a ton, because then I knew I could select with confidence that, oh, this is the gray heron. And so you can select it either from the details page or from that list page. And then we have a great observation that we can make available to everyone else um, in the world for research. So really, really cool. I highly recommend downloading it um, and playing around with the app because it's been, it's made our nature walks like with my kids like so much more fun. All right, then really quickly, I can show you, we actually trained a species classification API as well that does that. So if I take a quick look at this, the zebra is gonna be too easy. Um, the elephant's probably easy too. Well, we can see what kind of elephant because there's actually a lot of different species of elephant. So if the internet's working, yay, okay, cool. So this is, um, there's so many different types of elephants. It was able to predict with about 68.5% uh, accuracy that this was the African bush elephant um, as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's, let's see if this is a seal or a sea lion or what we got here. And so we're sending this to our API. This is a harbor seal um, and not a gray seal or south ele um, southern elephant seal. 
So you can see kind of the results. So this is something that was trained with the iNaturalist data set and gives you a good sense of that. So um, if anyone wants to use this, in this case, we're very sure that this was an American alligator and not various other crocodiles and such. All right, so really cool look. Um, the species um, API is something that we, um, we have available in private preview right now. So if any of you guys are interested, um, let me know and I can generate an API key for you um, if that's something that would be useful to any work that you're doing. Um, I'm happy to share. And then finally, the very last thing I want to talk to you about is a group called WildMe. So WildMe is the name of the company and WildBook is their platform. So the problem they're trying to solve is to not have to tag animals to identify them. So here's an article from National Geographic where um, there was this very rare whale that was found in the, off the Pacific Northwest and they were going to tag it um, and in the project, and because it was a rare whale, and then in the process of going to tag it, they accidentally killed it. And that completely defeated the point of what they were trying to do. So the idea is, do we have to tag animals or could we use computer vision to be able to differentiate between some of them? And so, you guys may have heard that, you know, us as, we as humans have a, a unique identifier as our fingerprints, right? Every human has a unique uh, fingerprint. Well, the same thing is true for the stripes on zebras, right? Every zebra has a unique stripe pattern and that can actually differentiate them. The same thing is also true for the spots on the neck of a giraffe and its torso. And then a, lo um, a lot of the spots on large cats as well and the fluke of a, of a whale. And a lot of these large animals do have some kind of distinctive characteristic that you can utilize. And so what they're doing is using those landmarks to be able to identify individual animals. So not just this is zebra, not a zebra, but rather this is this particular zebra. So what they do is when they capture a new image, they can compare it against their database of all known animals that they have identifiers for and either create a new one or they can um, say, oh, this is a known whale that we've seen before and give you back the exact species ID. Um, so that in itself is really cool, right? Like that is a really, really cool computer vision problem. But here's where the story goes from good to great. They're actually augmenting their data using social media. So let me explain this. Let's say I am just a random person and I go on a whale watching trip. So one of the, one of the um, wild books that they have is whalesharkorg which is the wild book for whale sharks. And so if I just go on a random whale watching trip and I take some video and I upload it to YouTube, basically they have an intelligent agent that wakes up at 10 p.m. every night and it searches the internet and it looks for whale sharks specifically. And then when it finds that data, it extracts keyframes, identifies the image, and then can actually add that to its data collection. And they're finding a whole bunch of new animals that you know, researchers aren't commonly targeting from new areas by kind of crowdsourcing this work and leveraging the power of social media. Cool, right? That's so much better than like Instagramming your food. Like so much more of a useful case. I love it. So. Here's how it works. I'm actually going to show you, let me show you a more visual demo because this one is kind of, um, th that shows it, but let me show it to you visually. So in this case, um, we have some video. So this is not their real system. This is a visualization in real life. This is all just batch jobs and not very exciting, but this is kind of a pretty front end that we put on it so that you could visualize it a little better. But basically there is a, um, a video, a YouTube video there, and it starts with a little intro. Um, note that it is in Spanish. Oh, and my internet's not behaving right now. So let's see if I can, uh, let me see if this is actually going to work, control copy. Let me start a new tab right here, but then I'll come back and see if the cache will work, okay. Um, here we go. All right, so if, are we happy now? Maybe, sort of, kind of. All right, but let me keep going. So basically, um, we want to process this video. So let's go ahead and process it. So what it's doing now is a couple things. So first of all, it's detecting the language. Note it's in Spanish, and boom, it just changed to English. So their primary processing does happen in English. So what they do first is leverage the Microsoft Cognitive Service for language translation. So they figure out what language it's in, convert it to English first. So you can see here that there's a whole bunch of, you know, they recognize it as Spanish, they did language detection, and then they translated it there. Um, the second step is text analytics. So they see things like world's biggest fish and whale sharks, and they know that this is something they want to dive more into, uh, pun not intended. 
Um, and then um, they're extracting video keyframes. So in this case, in this demo, they're doing it every two seconds. Um, in real life, they actually process every second. But you can see there's all these different images, and we're just extracting keyframes out of a video. Then we perform object detection. So you can see here that object detection is simply um, the practice of basically drawing a little bounding box around um, the image that you care about. So in this case, we're recognizing where the whale shark is in the image. And then here, we're extracting text from the video to see if there's any information here. Because basically, we want to find out three things. We want to re recognize the identity of that animal, but we actually want to know where and when it was seen as well. So if there's any kind of um, information on the where or the when in the text embedded there, they'll actually get that. So they're using, again, OCR, um, uh, optical character recognition, from uh, the Microsoft Cognitive Services to do that. And then finally, you can see here, they have, they know the when, because it was published in September 2017, and they said last month. So we know it was roughly um, August 2017, but we don't know the where. So their automated job will automatically post a comment in the YouTube video that says, great job, you know, where did you see this whale shark? I know. So the first thing I said to them is, does that work? Because YouTube commenters are like the worst of humanity. Um, but they said, yes, they're, they're, oh, I wish I could remember the exact response rate, but it was really high. It was like over 50%. I remember being like, oh, wow, people are responding. I think people just get really excited when someone new actually looks at their vacation photos than their mom, that it's like, oh, wow, they respond. So anyway, we have that. We saw the, um, the thing. And now, moving on, so we still need to figure out the where, so we'll come back to that. But for right now, let's see if we can process that animal. So um, what it's doing first is finding the orientation. So there's a lot of different images here, and basically um, they try to do them either all facing right or all facing left to be able to swap it. So if, if it's facing the other direction, they can mirror the image to get a sense of which side it is on, because it could look different on either sides of the animal, right? The right spot pattern is going to look different from the left spot pattern. So they have to figure out the orientation, identify the matchable region there that you saw, and then it grabs the landmarks and does the landmarking there. And then you can see it, it came up with a list of um, matching. And it has high confidence on this animal H019, and actually some moderate confidence on other images, and then there was moderate on a different animal right there. But with, with pretty high confidence, it looks like it's this first guy, H019. So we can assign that a match, and those things can be done automatically too, because remember, this is really a batch job. And so we've matched this guy. Then what we can do is go back and see that, oh, she actually responded, and she saw it while diving east of uh, um, this area. And so we can uh, set that as the location, and now we know everything. And then they give, um, it actually does kind of a neat thing where it, it posts a reply where it says, um, whenever it uses the data from that video, it actually posts a message and lets them know that, hey, we actually, you actually helped science. Um, we found this particular whale shark in your imagery, and you can see everything we know about it here. And they give you a link, and this is actually hitting their live site right now. So I'm going to their, out to their live site. So this part is real. And this is a particular whale shark that does exist, the H019, um, right here. And come on, internet, please. Oh, there we go. So you can see um, you actually have the ability to um, name uh, the, the whale shark. And so someone actually named this whale shark um, John Cena, who is a popular wrestler. Um, and so, OK. Uh, so someone named him John Cena. So now we, we can, you can give him a cutesy little name. Um, and then here's the other thing that's cool about this. Uh, it actually leverages, this is why they call themselves wild book, like the Facebook of animals, because it will actually map co-occurrences. So it sees, okay, this whale has been spotted with this other animal, so it shows that they're actually um, probably a, a child-parent relationship or mated or something like that, but you can see the other whale sharks that it, it hangs out with on a regular basis. So you can see how often it's been seen hanging out with these other guys. And then it also will give you a map, too. So there's, here's all the different sightings. So you can go back and see all the different sightings of this particular animal. And then it also gives you a map, which is not rendering. Uh, OK, sorry, we're having some internet issues. But there's an awesome, oh, there we go. Here it comes. Um, this can track the migration patterns of individual animals. Isn't that amazing? So really, really cool stuff, leveraging the power of machine learning and leveraging social media there. So you can see kind of where he's been cited, where he's been seen um, over time, and, and get some of this migration uh, information. So definitely go check out uh, whalesharkorg too, because it's really, really cool stuff. OK, the very end here. So what we've done is 
right here. You guys have seen all this. You just saw Wild Me. So here we are. So I showed you kind of a whirlwind tour of five different projects that are all AI for Earth grant recipients. Everyone is using machine learning to make some kind of an impact in conservation or farming or um, animal biodiversity, um, all of these different things. And there's a whole lot of papers, so quick, if you want to take a quick photo, here's all the references um, that are available. So the AI for Earth website is um, up there, as well as more information on Premonition, Farm Beats. Um, the paper that um, one of the researchers uh, published on Spot, which is an awesome paper, if you're not used to reading um, graduate level papers. I know it can be a little daunting, but this one is such an easy read. It's like three pages. It's explained very clearly. It's an awesome paper by Elizabeth Bondi. Um, and then the iNaturalist and the Wild Book websites as well. So really, really amazing work. And then remember, there is a pot of free money out there. If anyone you know, friends, work in machine learning, anyone who's doing work in conservation or any of that stuff, do let them know they can apply for a grant because I'd love to see some more from Poland. And then hopefully all of us together can help make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you very much for your great speech. Thanks a lot thank for you. joining us. This thank is a small gift for you. Oh, thank you, so thank you for much. being here with us. Thanks a lot. Thank you.